Miranda, because she is very flexible and capable, will be able to hit the ground running if, if and when um, she joins us, uh, if that's okay. We have um, uh, been on a few calls in the past, um, which which has been great. So um, I'm looking forward to oh, Did I see Miranda popping in? Hello, about sorry to... about that. <laughs> My sincere apologies uh, for the delay. Just a bit of an issue in assigning uh, breakout rooms um, and I, I'm in the right one now, it seems. So I'm, I'm very sorry about that. Uh, welcome, everybody. Alex, I'm not sure how much of an intro you did. Um, none at oh. all. Um, yeah. Well, welcome, ev everybody. Uh, and thank you for your patience uh, while, while we um, uh, yeah, just found our feet with the breakout rooms there. Um, I apologise. Um, so today we're talking about international poli policy perspectives and are so thrilled to be joined by our international friends and colleagues. Uh, we have Rochelle Wallens, who is the Social Procurement Manager of the Akina Foundation, and Emma Renatz, who's the Communications Manager of Biosocial Canada, and of course my lovely colleague Alex Hook, who is the Executive Director of Advocacy and Engagement. Um, so we might just whip around the room and, and I'm aware we are um, uh, just a little press for time. So I might start with you, Alex, if you just want to talk about um, the policy uh, settings that we have here in Australia and the work that you do uh, in relation to that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Miranda. Um, and we heard a bit of a summary from Dr. Molino in the introduction for those that were able to, to join. Certainly, um, we are in a, uh, and as Beck Scott mentioned as well, we're in a time of um, uh, almost unprecedented interest from the Commonwealth Government. So it's certainly been fantastic to see the engagement of a number of the committees um, and inquiries that are happening at the Commonwealth level at the moment. Um, we we still um, still look to um, the Victorian state as the as the leader of the policy landscape in the Australian context. Certainly, as Dr. Molino said, the social enterprise strategy, um, followed by the social procurement framework, and then a renewed social enterprise strategy in the Victorian landscape has certainly led us to grow. I'll rate that as an example. I will talk a bit more later about some of the features of that that we really like, and also some of the example also at the Commonwealth level of the Indigenous procurement policy um, as being one of the one of the great uh, well, precedents really of the Commonwealth government shifting their procurement to uh, to favour a you know a marginalised cohort in the indigenous business and to try and drive economic empowerment and economic growth through procurement spend and there's some amazing um, elements to that policy that we can really leverage from uh, and certainly I remember you know in in delivering training back when I first started at Social Traders we talked a lot about the the growth from $5 million a year of um, federal government procurement spend with Indigenous businesses in 2015, up to 500 million over two years. And we now see that they're measuring up beyond 6 billion that's been spent since inception of that policy. We can certainly see that the procurement as a lever certainly opens markets and we can look to those precedents to, um, to uh, showcase what can be achieved uh, through the social enterprise sector. And, and beyond the beyond that interest at the Commonwealth level, the, the interest uh, ebbs and flows with the with the states, but certainly seeing more and more um, uh, of an appetite to use procurement for the broader community benefit. So where we can continue to showcase social enterprise and the, the additional benefits that they provide, that's absolutely something that something that we'll be doing. And Emma, turning to uh, the policy settings in Canada, can you take us through that? Yeah, thank you, Miranda. Um, I just want to acknowledge quickly that I'm joining today from traditional Tlaman Nation territory on the west coast of Canada um, and joining from Bisocial Canada, which is a national social enterprise working on social procurement and social enterprise advocacy, education and consulting for those who aren't aware of what we do uh, over here. Um, in Canada, what we see at the federal level is there's been a, a federal social procurement policy since 2001. Um, 
And that policy was only able to come into effect after the Treasury Board, which holds the purse strings in the federal government, made a directive allowing for best value in procurement rather than just lowest cost. Um, and both of those pieces came about after a decade or more of multi-sector engagement and advocacy calling for this change in government. Um, people working on the inside in public service and people working in community intermediaries and social enterprise all across the country. Um, they've also announced a 5% target for federal procurement from Indigenous businesses, which is really exciting to see. Um, in Canada as well, we also see a lot happening in large and small municipalities across the country, which has been a really powerful place for change and impact in the country. Um, in British Columbia, which is the province I live in, there's a local uh, government-led initiative of over 37 rural and remote governments uh, who are all taking on social, social procurement, sharing best practices, training for a reduced fee to make it more accessible in those communities. Um, and then we also see a lot of major municipalities practicing some form of social procurement, Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, um, and they're also implementing community benefit agreements in major construction and infrastructure projects, which is pretty exciting to see those outcomes. And especially when it comes to construction um, and municipal policies, we've seen the ripple effect of having governments asking for this, meaning that the corporates in the construction sector are also starting to put in their own procurement policies and try to work with social enterprises and other social value suppliers um, to meet that demand, but also as Tara was talking about, you know, taking it further now into genuine, more authentic action as well. Um, I think we might share in the chat, uh, there's a jurisdictional scan in a recent report we did that shows other examples of implementation in the public sector from across Canada. So a really lengthy list um, and some examples of how they're implementing it. Um, and yeah, obviously a lot of corporates and institutions are taking this on as well, but it's more piecemeal at the moment. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Emma. And I've got those resources and we'll be sharing them in the chat shortly. And Rochelle, do you want to uh, take us through what it looks like in New Zealand from your perspective? Absolutely. Thank you, Miranda. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Rochelle Wallens toku inua uh, no te whanganui atara ahau. Uh, so, yeah, kia ora everyone. Um, I'm based in Wellington in New Zealand and I work for the Arkina Foundation and much like Social Traders and by Social Canada, we are a social enterprise that's trying to, uh, you know, increase impact in the economy and one of those levers is through social procurement, which is where I focus on. Uh, and, to take us through what this looks like in New Zealand, I'm always heartened to hear that this is happening in so many parts of the world and New Zealand is also part of that. So in 2018, New Zealand in, uh, introduced what they called the broader outcomes policy uh, and that sits within the government rules of sourcing. This is quite a big, big change. Uh, so it was really uh, empowering our government organisations to uh, that they must consider broader outcomes, but gave them a bit of flexibility on how they would deliver it. And from there, they had a few different focus areas, including um, allowing access for New Zealand businesses and social enterprises sit within that and were specifically named. But there are also other outcome areas around employment opportunities and environmental outcomes on waste and carbon, which many social enterprises are also delivering on. So it's kind of a two edge, a two two areas that you know social enterprise can contribute to government procurement. Uh, also, like Canada and Australia, uh, we're seeing a big shift in Indigenous procurement. And so in 2020, New Zealand introduced what they call the progressive procurement target and policy. Uh, and this set a, a, a target of 5% of the number of contracts that government was spending with had to be with Māori businesses. Uh, and this was actually increased to 8% last year, which was really um, exciting. The procurement, progressive procurement um, policy was really to start that supplier diversity um, journey and we include social enterprises in that um, and we've seen a massive massive uh, shift towards that and we think you know it's really important because Indigenous businesses in New Zealand many of them are operating in an impactful or purpose-driven way following Te Ao Māori principles uh, but also some of the changes that are having to be made are really uh, enabling access for social enterprises and other SMEs too, because it's how you change procurement. Uh, so 
it's not just governments. This is flowing into local government New Zealand. So, and in fact, uh, we're actually seeing the shifts happen faster in local government because they're a lot more community driven um, and closer to that community. So uh, in Auckland, they've been, um, they're quite far on this journey around implementing social procurement and have quite clear targets. Um, but, and also we're seeing this pop up in lots of different of the region's areas. And like some of the, you know, Emma and Alex have said, this has major flow on effects into the sort of whole entire economy. So private sectors are good organizations are responding to this and sort of, you know, taking up the challenge and thinking, oh, actually, this is this is important to us too. Uh, and so how can we uh, change our policies internally to make this happen? Awesome. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, and I'm gonna my next question is gonna be a bit of a two-parter, and we might stick with you, Rochelle. What's been sort of keys to success in in policy that you see, and where do you think there's room for improvement? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think the key success is really having really clear goals about what you're trying to achieve and in really specific areas, and also having sort of quite clear targets on what what's kind of setting that that um, momentum to go forward. Uh, like you know there isn't targets for social enterprises in New Zealand and I think that's sort of hold, holding it back so I really do believe that we need to make sure we're pushing for that. Um, we're also seeing that you know this policy actually needs to be put into practice and so we actually see need to see more of the action side of it less, less of the talking and part to drive that we kind of really believe that we need clear measurement and reporting requirements for both you know direct engagements with small to medium businesses social enterprises but also uh, indirect spends so what are those big tier one suppliers doing um, and what you know to contribute to their social license to operate or to be partnered with government really uh, yeah, and really the other thing we're kind of saying is we need to make sure our policies focus on relational procurement and that sort of commercial management side of it. A lot of it's like there's a big talk in the RFPs and the tender documents about what we're going to do, but is it actually happening? And we're not quite seeing that kind of flow through into the data yet. Um, and this, this is where we think social enterprises um, can really shine because we know they're the gold, gold standard how to do this, um, but we just need to make sure this is right-sized and not just moving the reporting into these organisations. Absolutely. And um, Emma, your reflections on that question, what's been successful about the policy in your jurisdiction or the jurisdictions that you're aware of and where is there room for improvement? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of what Rochelle said is relevant um, in the Canadian context as well. Definitely linking strategy to policy is important for long-term success when people pull from their existing strategic goals or objectives that tends to create the most buy-in within the organization you see more of that culture change go across successfully you're using language that's already shared um, and then making sure that your metrics and your tactics are tied to those goals you move in that order uh, starting from the goal down instead of working backwards um, in terms of improvements, definitely measurement and reporting are the things that we are trying to push the most moving forward. We want to see more people saying publicly what they've done with their policies, how much they're spending and with whom. Um, and in Canada, social procurement policies can emphasize social enterprise, but they don't always. Um, it's much more open to other social value suppliers as well. So co-ops, small businesses, local businesses diverse and indigenous owned businesses. Um, and we really want to see social enterprises still have a spot in those policies, still be mentioned in those policies, even if there isn't a local social enterprise in that organizational community, that they're creating the market demand and showing that there is support for social enterprises, something that we'd really like to see continue moving forward. Awesome. And um, Alex, your thoughts on that, that same question? I know we've touched it on, uh, on it a little bit um, around federal government uh, engagement with um, looking to uh, the Victorian social procurement framework, for example. What are your thoughts on uh, what works and, and where is there room for improvement? Yeah, thanks, Miranda. And, and great points from Rochelle and, and Emma. That, that idea around strategic alignment, I think, is really critical and targets changing behaviour and, and catalyzing um, action is, is really important. So um, can't can't be understated. I think interestingly, you know, I mentioned in the intro the, the Victorian social procurement framework and the Indigenous um, procurement policy, and a few key points to pull out of the, the 
my favourite bit of those uh, in the Victorian social procurement framework, there is increasing requirements with increasing spend. So there might be a little bit more effort required to uncover these larger opportunities, but sometimes hidden opportunities. So that sliding scale um, in the Victorian SPF, I think is really important. And it also uh, influences the broader market, as Rochelle said earlier, this does change the economy. So in Victoria, every, con every um, procurement above 20 million has to have a social procurement plan. And so whether that's government looking for carve offs, as was Dan, uh, Dr. Molino's suggestion uh, earlier, um, or set asides, or whether they're influencing the, the commercial suppliers, these are, the, these are the sorts of things that change behaviour and, and influence the broader economy. So I'm not saying push it all down the supply chain, um, but there is uh, really, it is really important to include um, the social value criteria within that decision making process. Um, but also on the flip side of that, don't forget the below threshold spends. So in the mandates in the Indigenous procurement policy are, are really critical to go to the social benefit suppliers first and then the commercial market uh, afterwards. That lifts procurement on its head. Like that, that really shows social first uh, as, as, a, as a complete shift in the way that procurement is delivered. It's not to say good procurement out, social procurement in, but it is to say that for every small spend, there is an opportunity to go to your chosen social, social um, procurement or social benefit supplier cohort first, uh, and then look for um, uh, the, the broader commercial suppliers after that. Um, and convenience can play a role. So sometimes if there are higher thresholds for social benefit suppliers or social enterprises, procurement professionals will, will go to the one or three quotes instead of the tender process for that. So you know, making it the easy option, I think, is, is really important. And then back to the social procurement framework in Victoria, not every procurement activity will deliver every outcome. We hear a lot from our government clients in some jurisdictions where policy has overlaid policy that's overlaid policy, and there are lots of different things to have to cover within the same procurement activity. That becomes too hard for procurement. That puts too much onus on the procurement function to solve everyone's problems in the framework approach to decide which social benefit you're going to focus on based on supplier market capability or location or um, impact area, that provides discretion to the procurement professional to go to market in the most appropriate way for the largest potential social impact. So that would be something that's, that we would recommend as well in terms of, and this can be, you know, this could be applied to government policy, but also equally organisational policy aligning it to your strategy, setting targets, understanding that not every procurement will solve every problem, increasing uh, effort as, as spend increases, but not forgetting those smaller, often business changing, what's going to say life changing, but business changing first opportunities for, for social enterprises is really critical too. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. I do want to leave time for, for questions. So I'm just going to ask a quick one of the panel as well. Um, maybe starting with um, you, Emma. Where's, what's future directions for social procurement policy um, in Canada? What do you sort of see as being uh, next on the horizon? I think for policy, I mean, obviously, we want to see more policies and we want to see more of that policy to action movement, taking it seriously, implementing it. My cat's making an appearance. Um, <laughs> but I think also when we look at social procurement and, and bringing social enterprises into the centre, like we really do see them as being a central part of the marketplace revolution that we're trying to create. So it's supporting um, the mainstreaming of social enterprise in Canada and the capacity building supports around social enterprise and especially um, we are seeing this happen federally with um, 100 million and 700 million dollar investments and funds for social enterprises and other social value businesses um, but the jury is out on how impactful this has been how easily it's reaching the right people um, and we really want to see that government um, and any other small business capacity building investments are accessible to nonprofits because that's been a really big sort of policy barrier in Canada thus far. Um, yeah, so just really trying to see social enterprises being centered more in the movement uh, and the mm -hmm. conversation around social procurement for sure. 
And Rochelle, what do you think from, from a New Zealand perspective? Where do you see uh, the direction of social procurement heading? Yeah, great question. Uh, and just for context, for those who don't know, New Zealand's just had a change of government, and this has created a little bit of uncertainty. We know this happens in all uh, countries, and there's you know the nature of politics um, that certain governments will have different priorities and language. But really, most governments see the value of social enterprise and social procurement. It's just how we talk about it, and uh, I think the shift is going to be onto genuine outcomes. And this is where social enterprises, are, you know, we know are strong and. Um, in the wider context, not just government, you've got more and more talk about ESG, you've got some of those ethical procurement um, aspects around modern slavery and, and scope three. Uh, and we really want to see the opportunity for social enterprises to be at the forefront of it and the leaders um, to kind of show everyone else how this can be done and the value of working uh, in this purpose driven way. Yeah, awesome. Um, Alex, any quick predictions from you before we open the floor to questions? Very quickly, just think that the sector coming together behind cohesive messaging makes it really easy for government to agree and work with us. And I think that's something that's happening really well uh, in Australia, working at the Commonwealth level, directly with Social Enterprise Australia, sitting side by side, and again, at each state level, with, with um, strong and, and growing uh, state-based networks. Um, being the leaders of advocacy and bringing the sector around a shared message, that is really critical. Right. Um, so we've got a few minutes for questions. Um, Alice, did you want to take yourself off mute and ask the one who popped in the chat? And other people can feel free to add in their contributions um, just over the next couple of minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, so I work for uh, CIFA, Social Enterprise Finance Australia. We work with a lot of early stage social enterprises and social enterprises that are looking to grow. And we know that government procurement is one opportunity for them. But I was wondering if the panel had any insights on <clears throat> for, for organizations that haven't done this before, um, how should they get started? Who wants to take that? Might be a bit of a first in, uh, just given the time. Emma, any thoughts from you? I can jump into that one. Yeah, I think two things that come to mind, first of all, is really honing your ability to tell your organization's story, your enterprise's story, and what you do and the impact that that creates is one of the most important parts of any bid or any any sort of relationship building with government. And then I think the second thing is to, to try, if it's possible, if you can figure out who the key contacts are and build those relationships and sort of get to know the inroads into those procurement opportunities. Michelle, what are your just, thoughts on that one? I was just gonna add, I'm completely agree about telling your organizational story. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it does need to make it clear how you're different from other businesses. The other thing is leaning into certification. So I've been a procurement person working for a government department. Uh, they want reassurance that you that organizations are um, purpose-driven. And so organizations like Social Traders and Arkina and by Social Canada and, and uh, Canada are um, kind of helping you in that respect and making it easier for the uh, procurement people. And also many of those organizations will also, can also support you through how you might engage with those government procurement um, tenders because we know they're not easy and we are trying to advocate for people to do that better and differently. But um, yeah, because I understand that it's a challenge. Great. We might have, I've got time for one more question. If anybody uh, can quickly get a question out in the next 10 seconds. Um, otherwise, I might throw back to Alex to answer his answer that one with that minute, or invite anyone no, to quickly. No surprise that we say call call your local social traders state lead if it's a state government question. They'll be able to help navigate that system. Learning how the government buys what it is that you sell is the most important thing. It might be through panels, it might be through tenders, it might be low threshold. They can just directly engage so understanding that who the players are and then building the relationships uh, I think it's really important. Unless there's any other questions from this group I know it is I know it is um, getting tight but please feel free to there, pop them in if they're specific. There is one in um, the chat Miranda that oh, is there? Yeah. 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 yeah so we might um, I can't see it I'm sorry but we can direct that 
um, to the, the panel yeah. later, but I guess just with about 30 seconds left before we all get pulled out, um, closing thoughts from our panelists who I um, really want to thank for being here. Emma, any, any last words? I think I've said a lot of it, but yeah, I just um, really affirming, maybe the last thing I'll say is um, that social procurement we really see isn't the outcome, it's the tool to help mm -hmm. achieve these social value outcomes we are trying to create. So really support more. the policy and also want to see where it's taking us. Yeah, awesome. Rochelle? Yeah, completely reiterate that. Uh, I, my view is we won't even call it social procurement in the future. It will just be how good procurement is done. And what we mean by fair and transparent procurement will include social enterprises and SME.